Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to this event on Kenya elections 2022. What is next? We are delighted that you could join us this morning or this afternoon for those who are joining us in other parts of the world. My name is Mvemba Pezo Dizolele, a senior fellow and director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I am honored to welcome our panelists today, Dr. Karuti Kanyinga, research professor at the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Nairobi, Dr. Wandia Njoya, associate professor at Daystar University, and Dr. Collins Odote, lawyer and associate professor at the University of Nairobi. On August 15th, Mr. William Ruto, the current Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, was declared the winner of the 2022 presidential election by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. But the main contender, Mr. Raila Odinga, has challenged the results and will head to court. This, of course, means that we will revisit the election itself today, what happened on August 9th when Kenyans went to the polls and how did the election unfold and if there is ground of course for court challenge. It's been noted that um, it's been two decades since Kenya last had elections that were not fully contested, that were considered credible, fair and transparent. But since then the last three elections have all brought their own issues and challenges. In 2007, there were issues of reports of dead voters, ballot stuffing, and so on. In 2007, uh, in 2013, pardon me, there were issues of uh, balance between peace and security, uh, Supreme Court petition, and so on. And of course, in 2017, there were issues of removal of commissioners, legal reforms, and so on. Our panelists here today will unpack all that. First, we'll hear from our panelists in the order which they will be introduced. I will then moderate a discussion with the panelists, and after that, we'll open it for questions and answers. And you can submit your questions through the link on the event page. Dr. Karuti Kaninga is an accomplished development researcher and scholar with extensive national and international experience and exposure. In the last 29 years, he has carried out much research, many research programs and projects at the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Nairobi. He has published extensively on development and governance and is renowned for his contributions to scholarship and knowledge in governance and development. Dr. Wandia Njoya is an associate professor whose teaching and research interests cover gender, culture, and politics in Africa and African diasporas, particularly as they are reflected in literature and film. The central theme in all of her work is her interrogation of what it means to be human with its gendered, racial, and geographical dimensions in today's world. In 2007, she obtained a doctorate in French from the University of Pennsyl from Pennsylvania State University, pardon me. Dr. Collins Odote is a lawyer with a degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Law from the University of Nairobi. He joined the University of Nairobi as a tutorial fellow in May 2010, but had taught before then on part-time basis at the University of Diplomacy, at the, University, at the Institute for Diplomacy and International Studies of the University of Nairobi. In 2011, he has taught, since 2011, he has taught at the Center for Advanced Studies in environmental law and policy as a lecturer and service the School of Law at the University of Nairobi. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. 
And without further ado, I will, work, I will invite our panelists to make their introductory remarks, starting with Dr. Kanyinga. Uh, thank you very much, Remba, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to um, be here uh, with you to discuss Kenya's 2022 elections. Uh, let me begin by pointing out that um, the August 2022 elections um, is slightly different from uh, the past two elections that you have posed, uh, you have looked at the 2013 and the 2017, although uh, the three of them um, were being carried out uh, under the context of uh, a new constitution that was meant to address the challenges or um, constraints that under led Kenya to a civil conflict way back in 2007. When you look at the 2022 um, elections, uh, two things, two or three things come out very clearly. Um, and I would like to raise them um, uh, in terms of the challenges to Kenya's democratic process. One of them, of course, is the fact that uh, for the first time, we can say there were no sharp ethno-regional differences of the manner in which we have seen um, uh, the past elections. Uh, meaning here that um, if you were to compare the 2022 elections with the previous uh, uh, two elections, you would say that uh, uh, the ethnic, uh, ethno-regional negative uh, narratives that have always shaped the Kenyan politics uh, were absent uh, in this election in this, uh, if we compare to the past. The intensity was slightly different. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, for the first time in this particular election, uh, we saw quite a number of issues that Kenyans said um, there are issues that uh, any particular leader coming to office uh, should address. Issues of the economy, uh, cost of living, uh, corruption or governance in general uh, ranked highly and were prioritized by all candidates who were campaigning for uh, uh, for presidency and even the, uh, the local level. Unfortunately, I must say this, uh, we didn't see discussions on institutional development to safeguard Kenya's democracy. And that's why I would like to say, uh, in the context of how we have seen these elections, it's uh, like making two steps forward and one step for, uh, backward. As we speak, and I think this is a, an issue of um, uh, the entire continent and everywhere in the world really to look at, is the question of election technology. Uh, for the last two elections, and including this one, uh, electoral technology is being seen as a constraint rather than uh, as a factor that facilitates democracy because Questions are being raised about the kind of technology uh, that was used in this particular um, uh, in this particular election. Uh, the last point to mention here uh, is the voter turnout. Um, one may want to say that um, um, we had the, one of the lowest uh, voter turnouts uh, in recent times, a voter turnout of 64 uh, or 65 percent, which is very high uh, by world standards. But that on its own. Uh, said, sends a signal that uh, many people could be disillusioned uh, with the politics and political leadership, and more so disillusioned with Kenya's political elites and how they organize politics around self-interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanyinga. From your uh, remarks here, there are a few takeaways for us. Uh, one is that there have been some departure uh, this time from previous elections particularly in the areas uh, of ethnic and regional differences that have often caused tension. But you deplore the lack of development issues, I bet, on the ballot as, as part of the discourse leading to the election, which you consider to be, of course, uh, two steps forward in the way things unfolded and one step backward. Uh, but technology is also one that you've mentioned, that it should have been it's often considered as a constraint and as opposed to really advancing democracy, which I was in Kenya during this time, uh, during the election. I was actually in Kiambu County. From what, where we stood, it seems like the machine, especially the Kim's kit, worked quite well. Uh, not a lot of incidents of faulty functioning. So when we go to q and A, it's something that I'd like you to address a little bit and how you, you see the technology uh, should have been helping, but has been considered constraint. And then, of course, the, the issue of voter turnout. Uh, we also like to ask more on that issue to see if there were public discontent or if there were other structural issues that kept people away 
from voting. Uh, now we'll turn to Dr. Wandia Njoya, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, just to alert the audience, I am in literature and I read elections from that lens. Uh, so I want to piggyback on uh, what Dr. Kanyinga said about disillusionment. And what I want to talk about is how Kenyans feel about elections, how they interpret uh, what happens at, in, in elections and what they remember. Um, I think for me, there were two streams uh, of the 2022 elections. I think there was an election and there was a referendum. So the elections were for the people below the presidency, the governors, the MCAs, uh, the women's reps, all those seats. There was, I think, a genuine election and people were invested in those uh, elections because uh, people feel that those are the seats which are directly related to their daily lives. Then there was a referendum on the presidency. Um, so with the elections, we saw many good gains. We saw an increase in women uh, taking the seats like the governor's seats. We saw MCAs, for example, uh, you know, overcoming really major hurdles to, to win the seats, even though they had no resources. And uh, I think at the lev lo local level, these uh, elections reflected what people are really interested in. They're interested in politicians addressing the issues. But when it comes to the presidential elections, I think uh, we were forced into a referendum on the Uhuru legacy because he did not uh, graciously uh, exit power as, as we, should, we expected. Uh, and so we were forced to make a choice between Uhuru's past and his future, his past being his relationship with his deputy president. And of course, the future was uh, his new alliance with uh, Raila Odinga, and they had even tried to change the constitution, and we had been promised that that would happen. So I think uh, that put Kenyans in a bind. It made people have to make very crazy choices. Uh, some people had a lot of people, of course, the majority chose between uh, the options he gave us, but also between those two choices, we had uh, some comic relief from a weed smoking uh, professor and from a preacher. I th and then others of us decided to spoil the ballot. So um, I'm also concerned about the alienation of people with disabilities. We had two major seats which were being contested, one by a person in a wheelchair for the gubernatorial seat in Nairobi, and then we had a presidential candidate who was visually challenged, and those two were not allowed to contest the, the elections for various political and bureaucratic reasons. Um, I think in the end, the people chose, of course, I am, I am conscious that the, the, the result is disputed, but I think people decided to do away with uh, the future of Uhuru and just cut ties with that uh, legacy and, and move on. But uh, of course, uh, there's a problem with the way we interpret elections, which I'm just going to come to. Um, and that I'm going to relate to the coloniality of power. I think Kenyan elections have been interpreted over the last uh, many decades on the tribal angle. And we are forced to do that by international and local forces. So the tribalism narrative is used by the media. It's also used by the academy, academy because we are quoting people who, outsiders who have the money and the resources to interpret our elections. Also, a lot of uh, NGOs who are involved in civic education and democracy, they receive their, their funds from, from abroad. So I think because of that, it has been very hard for us to wean ourselves off the tribal uh, narrative for explaining elections. So uh, because, and this is the main point I want to make, that Kenyans uh, elect on very complex uh, issues. You know, there's identity, there's history, there's, uh, you know, political choices. And in this case, especially for the presidency, it was a political stand that, that a lot of people were taking, although other people interpreted it as tribalism. 
And um, I think the hugest stumbling block to our ability to interpret the elections in the, the unique and very rich and varied tapestry of Kenyan politics is this, uh, this um, hegemony of, of interpretation that, that values tribe more than anything else. Um, so what I want to say is that I think uh, we need a multiplicity of stories that explain why Kenyans vote the way they vote. And that has been shown by the, elect, the voters themselves. I think the challenge is to us who do the interpretation, who remember previous elections. We need to widen the scope of, of uh, narratives and stories by which we interpret how Kenyans vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Njoya. Uh, important contribution there uh, that you've made. Um, Two streams you talked about, one kind of dissecting the election themselves, how they panned out, is uh, two levels at the municipal level or, or sub-constituency levels where people literally voted for the issues, voted for representation in the daily life uh, challenges, um, MCA and others. And then, of course, the presidency, which in, in, in so many ways was a referendum on the legacy of the outgoing president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, perhaps also that entire challenge and dichotomy that has happened between, I think, what was dubbed during the uh, campaign as dynasty and hustler nation, that way of looking at things. But I also wonder if in this bucket you were also talking about the crazy choices, if there was any um, difference in terms of age between the two candidates, the generational challenges where one candidate was seen as being younger and ushering a new generation, albeit he's been in politics for a long time himself, uh, but then the other candidate being seen as from the uh, older generation. I'm not sure if that is the case, but that's something we can take during the uh, questions and answer. You also talked about alienation of certain groups, uh, particularly persons with uh, disability. That was interesting in so many ways because even structurally, a lot of the polling stations were not equipped to, they were just not uh, set up, uh, even just the entrance to access the, uh, the polling station. And then once you were inside, the ballot boxes were often placed too high for people who might have been on, on wheelchair and so on. So to be something that we can explore further. Um, you talked about the coloniality of power and the narrative, who set the narrative. I think this is a challenge that uh, many African countries face, uh, not just Kenya. And there also it will be interesting to explore ways that can be changed. Uh, how do we give more power or space to local media or to local groups that cover those events? And uh, the big surprise, uh, perhaps it should not have been a surprise, is that uh, the uh, tribal, if you will, those were your terms, or ethnic uh, wedges and fault lines did not play a major role this time, at least not in any way that was apparent. So thank you very much. We'll turn to Professor Collins Odote. Are you on mute, sir? Yes, I just noticed, uh, and thank you very much for reminding me. The beauty of coming last after Karuti and Rwandia is that you can very easily say I agree with them uh, and hand it over to the panelists. But I will not agree with them fully. So I will add a few thoughts of Byron. I think the first one is the way our Rwandia ended. Uh, I think we had a very interesting an election, an election where, as Karuti says, an election which was largely based on issues and an election where the normal fault lines uh, were not there. Uh, but I think uh, it's important to underscore the fact that while tribe did not play a major factor in the election, it continues to be something at the back of uh, voters' mind, at the back of conversation. I think two things demonstrate that. Number one is when you look at the election outcome, the election outcome was put in the basis of a map. Uh, and that map then starts having a conversation in terms of regions, in terms of what that then means. And I think related to the fact that although we are 10 years after we adopted a new constitution, a constitution that introduced devolution, 
the place of the presidency in terms of allocation of resources and in terms of uh, utilization of power uh, continues to have an uh, i think an enduring legacy in kenya something i think uh, we will have to grapple with as we move forward in terms of de deepening our democracy that's i think the first statement i wanted to make the second statement i wanted to make uh, and you are having a joke with karuti uh, when karuti was saying that you know this is the first election uh, you, you guys in the west are wondering why was there no violence uh, why did we have an election that is extremely peaceful and i think one of the things for us as an enduring nation is the importance of institutions and institutional reform uh, i think despite uh, the fact that we always have some sour taste in some people's mouth at the end of an election we all admit as kenyans that institutional reform has made us have progress over the last uh, two decades if you looked at the last elections i think the confidence in the judiciary is such that even when somebody feels that they have lost everybody is clear the way to go is not in the streets the way to go is in the judiciary number two you had an election where for the first time uh, the police even when there was instances where people thought oh maybe they might behave like normally they behaved completely abnormally. They were kind, they treated, even provoked, they treated people extremely well. The third is if you see the conversations around the IBC, you see two, uh, the electoral management, you see on the one instance, a chair who was extremely firm and made a position, and but at the same time, you see a group of four renegade commissioners who are then saying, no, we're unhappy with this. I think just demonstrating both the good and the work that still requires to be done in terms of ensuring we have uh, serious institutional uh, reforms. My second last issue I think that's important is issues of technology that Karuti mentioned. I think these elections have demonstrated to us that technology does not replace integrity and does not replace trust. Uh, well, I think for a long time as Kenyans, we have used technology not to enhance efficiency, I remember a judge telling me that the prof, we made an advocate for technology for results transmission. How can we be waiting for results seven days later? Yet technology is supposed to be ensuring that we do things quickly. It's because we have been adopting technology as a country largely for integrity issues. I think this election demonstrates to us that technology is supposed to help solve issues around efficiency. Uh, integrity must be addressed in terms of trust issues, must be addressed in terms of how different actors interpret. It cannot replace human beings. My last issue, I think, is a question about the, inclu the inclusiveness and comprehensiveness of the kind of people who vote. I think we had an election where, although we have been making the point as a country that we are increasingly youth, we had an election where the voters register showed that the one category of people who registered least in terms of they had their numbers reducing from 2017 to 2022 are the young people. Secondly, they are the ones who are least concerned about going, turning out to vote. Uh, and were extremely dissatisfied with the quality of their governance. And I think one of the things that that demonstrates is how do you ensure that as you govern, as you conduct elections, you are conducting elections that speaks to the majority of the population, a majority of the population that is young. And I think that goes to your point about, so what has this election shown us? This election has led to a situation where if you look at the outcome of elections, we have had a generational coup, so to speak. Uh, I think the, the group of people who were there before independence are essentially out of Kenya's leadership and governance. So we've had a change in terms of leadership age coming to the 40s and 50s. I was actually cracking a joke with a friend of mine that if you are 60 and above and you are lucky to be elected, you must recognize that this is your last election uh, because this election has ended up creating a new crop of leadership, a leadership that will then have to take the country to the next level. And I think something that is both exciting, but also something that provides us with very useful lessons moving to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Odote. Uh, from your intervention here, a few takeaways. One is the importance of institutions and institutional reforms and the impact that they have in this process. The conscientization of the electorate in the way that they handle their own issues and even the affiliation with the regions or with their ethnic uh, groups. Uh, you also talked about security and the role that they played. I think uh, it was as if there was some trust in uh, security uh, agencies that were represented, but also that the police themselves had made it clear that they wanted to push this process along in a positive way. Uh, they were quiet, they contributed kindly to the entire process as it unfolded. Technology is one that you mentioned as well. 
the challenges thereof, of course, technology is not perfect. It does not, in other words, replace integrity and trust, or at least it doesn't automatically promote that, which means there's some issues of trust deficit somewhere along the way. However, I think you agree that efficiency was encouraged and it pushed it, meaning the technology pushed efficiency. Issues of inclusiveness, inclusivity is one that you raise, as well as the limited registration of youth. Although there, I wanted to ask that you consider um, addressing the fact that there were many youth that were represented among the leadership of the polling stations. So everywhere we went, we saw typically either the president, presiding officer or the clerks, just the, it was very apparent that youth was really involved, uh, at least in the leadership of polling stations and polling center. That's something that really uh, struck out quite a bit. And then, of course, we made reference to the generational gap, uh, new blood and shift and, uh, and leadership in the country. With that, we'll engage our, more, our questions here, question and answer. By the way, I'd like to tell our audience that I'm going to be using my... Uh, Apple phone here to take questions from you. So when I'm using my phone, I'm not texting anyone. I'm just actually taking your questions. <laughs> this is the way of technology these days. So we'll go back to Dr. Kanyinga. Uh, your concern about uh, no discussion on development is very important. What did you mean by that, especially when we consider the way moving, the way forward, right? This issue will go to court the president, there will be a president, president will be seated. And how do you see that issue playing out in, engage, in the policy engagement? Well, well th th thank you very much. Let me um, emphasize that um, um, we, we saw um, both candidates uh, in this last election talking very much about uh, uh, what they would like to do uh, to revive the economy, what they would like to do to address the uh, cost of living. Um, but one may not say that uh, the, the, the campaign should push to that one as an agenda uh, in a very deep manner or in a very substantive manner. Uh, the issue that uh, everyone is worried about in this country is the physical room uh, to do economic governance or even to address uh, uh, economic challenges that the country is facing. Um, and that uh, absence of a sufficient uh, physical room to do so um, is the result of pu high public debts, that uh, huge public debts that the, uh, the country has. So we are beginning uh, uh, the reign of a, a new government with quite a number of economic challenges, but they are what, want uh, what we can call uh, substantive discussions, if one can say that. Um, of course, the, 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 uh, one can say that uh, it will depend on uh, the type of uh, men and women that uh, any new leadership that uh, will be in office, uh, whether it's the pre new uh, the, the president or in elect or whether the court does um, uh, call for uh, let's say a runoff or uh, uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the president elect is confirmed, uh, the issue is that that president will be meeting a very major economic challenge, and that's how we, to address that particular challenge will depend on the kind of men and women that they bring into office uh, to help them uh, address those particular uh, 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 challenges. In other words, I'm simply saying that we are beginning um, uh, 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 the period of a new government with uh, unprecedented economic challenges uh, brought uh, uh, about by uh, international economic environment, our own dom dom domestic context itself here, uh, the issues of uh, poor governance and in particular corruption, uh, quite a number of uh, 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 challenges uh, that we have and that will make uh, uh, the new government have uh, uh, a very challenging uh, be uh, beginning uh, point to, 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 uh, 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 as we move forward. Um, uh, Collins also mentioned the question of institutions themselves. Uh, we are beginning uh, uh, with uh, uh, a challenge on uh, uh, some of the institutions um, constitutional commissions that are supposed to, um, uh, if, if I can say, uh, check the excesses of the executive, um, have not been strong. The second generation of constitutional commissions or independent bodies that can check the powers of the president have been weakened over 
over the years. Um, and, and therefore, we begin uh, uh, the, the period of a new government with quite a number of challenges uh, that need to be looked into. But at the end of it, I must admit that uh, the men and women that will be brought by any new government will matter most. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So is your couple follow-up questions, were those issues on the table during the campaign? Uh, were they front and center or not? And also you just talked about institution that will check on the president have been weakened. Uh, can you expand on that as well? What does that mean? Because um, we thought with the reforms, those institutions would have been strengthened, but you just said the opposite. Let, let. Let me begin with the last uh, with the last comment about weak institutions. The Kenya's 2010 constitution is always seen as a very con con uh, very very progressive constitution that established independent uh, institutions to check on the excesses of the president and to ensure that um, um, uh, things are done right, if one can say that. But from 2017 onwards actually from 2018 onwards, we have seen the composition of uh, the, those particular, the staffing of those particular uh, institutions at very high level, uh, being staffed with the uh, people who are loyal uh, to political leadership or to political elites governing at any particular time. Uh, they are appointed not on basis of merit per se, but on basis of political considerations and political mer merit, they are for deepening uh, political patronage, meaning that those institutions are then um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, weakened uh, to a point that uh, they always stand there for the executive rather than checking the executive. That's what I meant. That we are be we began we are beginning um, uh, the new the, the period for a new government uh, with a weakened institutional base. The first generation of these particular bodies was uh, were very. Um, uh, we had very, very strong institutions that would always tell the president or anyone from the executive that uh, the constitution does not allow you to do that. They would always check on the excesses of the president, excesses of the executive in general, but we have not seen that in the, in the second generation of constitution and independent bodies. Going back to the first question on whether the issues of economic performance uh, and governance, whether they were on the campaign, uh, uh, platform. They were, but not in a manner that was deep enough for everyone to see uh, clearly how the candidates articulated them. I must admit that there are issues that are treated in their manifestos, uh, in their policy uh, uh, framework, but uh, having things on paper and what you do are two different things, if one can say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanyinga. Dr. Njoya, um you teased us quite a bit with the two streams there about the referendum on the presidency or the legacy of uh, President, uh, outgoing President Kenyatta and the election on the lower level, but equally important. Can you discuss a little more about that side of the election at the municipal and constituency level? Because to me, that sounds like it will be addressing some of the uh, challenges that Dr. Kaninga just presented. If people are very committed on that side, it's because they're really thinking about their livelihood, about their daily lives, about development, so to speak. And unfortunately, because of the power invested in the presidency, I think um, Kenyans are still heading for a heartbreak in terms of the choices they made. I think uh, devolution has delivered. I mean, if you're seeing uh, people really interested in, in the local level and more diversity of candidates. I think that's a sign that uh, devolution is delivering. However, the resources which are being at, um, allocated to the counties are still not enough for the kind of things uh, the counties want to do for the people. There's still a lot of corruption even at that level. And from what we are even seeing in terms of the, the current a shifting of political allegiances even before the new president has been sworn in. That's a sign that we are still, uh, the, the center is still too strong. And I think the agenda of, of Kenyans is to reduce that power and that focus on the presidency so that uh, devolution can deliver more for, for Kenyans at the 
the local level. So I think even though um, the, the the local counties are going to be doing having to do a lot of work in addressing some of the issues, because of the power of the central state, I think the, the central state will also be weighing in, unfortunately, a little too much in enabling in, in the counties being able to address the needs of the people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Let's go back to um, the crazy choices that you had referred to when it came to the legacy um, of the, uh, the outgoing president and how people were confronted. What are those crazy choices that you're referring to? I mean, there was a major shift over the last five years after the 2017 uh, election in which Uhuru and his deputy Ruto uh, carried the day. Um, then Uhuru made uh, an alliance with, with, with Raila, which alienated Ruto. So now we had a threesome amongst which Kenyans were supposed to, to choose. And then as the years went on, the, the, the polarization became more complete. So the deputy became, the deputy president became the opposition, and now the opposition leader became the, 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 the sort of the state candidate. So apart from having these two men being the people we had to choose from, there was a very awkward uh, discussion even during the campaigns where both candidates, where the, the supporters of both candidates are taking jabs at each other for their association with uh, Uhuru, which was awkward because both of them were associated with him, but in different ways. So I think it put Kenyans in a very awkward position where they had to choose between two siblings in the same threesome. And then uh, the problem now coming to the issue of tribe is that because tribe remains the zero sum explanation for everything, then uh, that, that dilemma is being washed away by the tribal narrative. And when I was talking about tribe, I am not saying that tribe did not feature. Of course it featured, but in Kenya, the tribal narrative has been used as a zero sum. Either you're tribal or it's something else. There's no mix of the two. In this case, we had a mixture that was so potent because uh, even though uh, many people might have been voting against the Uhuru succession, after the election, it's being read as uh, people not wanting to vote for, for Raila because of his ethnicity. And the thing is, it, you know, it's, it's who you believe. There's, there can never be a clear distinction between did I vote because of tribe or because the reason why he was vilified all these decades, almost five decades, by the Kenyatta regime was because of his, it was on the grounds of ethnicity. So even when you're rejecting him, it looks like it's an ethnic rejection and, and it, there was also a political issue. And I think, uh, I fault, I fault the international community and the, and the thinking classes, the journalists and the academics, because they, we prioritized tribalism so much and we never looked at what are the other uh, contradictions that Kenyans are grappling with. Apart from that one, even when you look at the map, which uh, uh, Professor Odote referred to, if you look at the map, that map also reflects the colonial land issues because um you know the issues about land go all the way to transoia it's not just in central province uh, there were settlers of course the british settlers in in uh, central but all the way through the rift and up to transoia it was you know the lower class british settlers or even the boers who had come from south africa so the way land issues are experienced in those areas compared to the coast. In the coast, the settlers are from, are Kenyans from central province. So we have uh, different interactions with the same problem, but in different ethnic uh, combinations. And so when we make uh, tribalism a zero sum game, we fail to see these other uh, mess messy entanglements that Kenyans are dealing with. And you see the problem with a vote is that it's only one. 
you can't vote twice you can't give your explanation on the vote it's just a number so all these complex stories and and entanglements are not reflected in the ballot and i think we need to do more work in explaining those things other than just taking this zero sum uh, one 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 the danger of a single story as Chimamanda Adichie called it. We have to multiply the stories and the complexities with which we are explaining how Kenyans are voting. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive there. Professor Odote, uh, I want to revisit this issue of youth representation and their engagement. Can you expand on that seeming gap? I was talking earlier about a lot of youth being represented at the polling stations and polling centers and so on, and uh, actually a lot of them lining up. Of course, that's not statistical, that's just what we saw. Um, but you run the numbers. Um, what does that say and why you, take the, you took the position that you did? Thank you very much. I think in 2002, when we had the election that, uh, as you rightly said, was the one which was non-contested, uh, that was the first election where we had a huge number of young people coming in as elected leaders. Uh, and I think since then, uh, the numbers of youth in leadership has actually increased. Uh, when we were going into this election, uh, it was extremely clear uh, that uh, the youth population was a critical component of uh, the main political contestations. Uh, the, the contestation of the president-elect and the contestation of the position leader, Raila Odinga. When the results of the voters' audit uh, for the elections came up, uh, there was huge surprise. But if you look at the 22 million people who were on the voters' register, as compared to 2017, the one demographic whose percentages of those who are registered had reduced were the young people. And I think this is something that we saw also the last two stages of the voter registration process. So here you have a situation where youth are more in the country, uh, youth are increasingly being represented in leadership, but youth don't seem to want to be on the voters register. That's number one. Number two, uh, while when you went to the polling stations, you saw young people as uh, polling officials, that's as clerks and uh, as uh, presiding officers, uh, the one thing that you did not ask yourself, and I think it would be nice when we get the, fi the, vi the final voter turnout, to see in terms of those who came out to vote, what are the different percentages? But I know from anecdotal conversations, I have many young people, including my son, who we had to have a huge conversation for him to register, but then he says, I don't want to register. So you see them as, Clerks, you see them as presiding officers, not because they care about elections, but because they care about a job. So they went there uh, because they are temporary staff being hired to go and get uh, a job. You talk to young people, they tell you, I don't feel the leadership. This voting will make no difference to me. And it is because they are looking at close to a decade of politicians making promises, politicians getting into office, and once they do, they don't see the practical differences in their life because politicians then prioritize private gain as opposed to public service. And I think that's the greatest challenge that you saw in the, in the contradictions between you increasingly see young people at the polling stations, uh, but you don't realize that what they're doing, they are providing a service as opposed to engaging in elections. That is different from when you went to the rallies. At the rallies, you'd see them. And I think people start having the conversations. Maybe they went to the rallies, not to listen to the message, but they went to the rallies to get the small token that the politicians give them. I think it is a challenge that as a country we'll have to grapple with in terms of ensuring that our young people are much more engaged in elections and in the governance of the country. Thank you very much there, Professor Dot. Is there a difference between the urban and um, the rural areas? In terms of, uh, in terms the of youth, youth engagement? In terms of youth engagement. I think if you look at the young people in the urban areas, uh, because of their engagement with the technology, they are much more aware. Uh, they follow the events much more. But in terms of voting, the surprising thing for me is from where I sit, I don't see the difference in terms of their registration, both from a rural area and from a post and from an urban area. I see in terms of the conversations, but not in terms of the actual electoral voting. So it isn't, I don't think, that their lack of engagement is because of lack of information. Their lack of engagement is because of what elections means to them. I think as the country has continued to suffer uh, economically, the young people have bought the brand 
of the economic challenges much more than the older people. I think the, challenge, the issues that Karuti was speaking about. So unless we address the economic situation of young people, we will have them much more disconnected from our politics, both at the rural and at the urban area. Thank you very much. This concludes this segment of our discussion here. We'll open it to uh, our audience. Uh, if you follow me, uh, please uh, send your question through the link uh, that you have on the event page. Uh, we'll take them as, uh, as they come and submit it to our distinguished panel. I will also, as I said earlier, be using my uh, iPhone, so I'm not texting, I'm just taking your questions. So the first question, actually, since we're talking about what is next, um, says William Ruto, the president-elect, states in his manifesto that he ran on a promise to defend the Constitution and personalization of political power. Do you think that the Ruto administration will deliver on this promise with regards to dealing with corruption, defending the Constitution, and ending the personalization of political power? I'll direct that question first to uh, Professor Odote. Uh, do I think that uh, William Ruto will hold on to his promise? Yes, that is correct. I, think I, I would like to change the question. I think the question for me is that he must uh, stick to his promise. I think first from my conversation, the politicians are want to make promises that they have no intention in keeping. Uh, so if we take that, there's a very likely possibility uh, that as a politician, and having been deputy president for 10 years, that he might depart from it. But I think the more important thing for me as a Kenyan is that we have a responsibility as citizens and a citizen group to hold William Ruto to account uh, on the things that he promised. We, we need to hold him account on the fight against corruption. Although he has had a past of being accused of corruption issues, I think corruption is one of the uh, endemic challenges for this country. Part of our economic challenges is because of corruption we will have to work hard to ensure he holds on to it. Secondly, thankfully, we have strong institutions. We have a judiciary that is credible. Uh, we have uh, a free media. So it is incumbent on, on the different institutions to hold them accountable. Because if we don't, there's a very likely possibility, especially if you look at some of the people around him, that the fight against corruption might suffer backburn. The second is the conversations around the change of the constitution. William Ruto was publicly very strong on the fact that BBI was about changing the constitution and that the constitution should not be changed. If you listen to the people who have sentiments that fear, they say, but we fear he may change the constitution. I think for me, what is important is we need to hold him to his public commitments and work hard to ensure that he doesn't slide from those public commitments. So for me, it's not about whether I think he will, it's about what do we do as citizens to ensure he does not backtrack from the commitments that he made, because those commitments are good for the country and good for our democratization. Thank you very much, Dr. Odote. Question um, that I will direct to Dr. Njoya. Uh, a member from the audience says, I agree tribe is not on the only angle to analyze the 2022 elections. However, on the low voter turnout issues in Mount Kenya, would not, wouldn't you say tribal politics played a part, given that none of the two leading presidential candidates are from Mount Kenya region? The voters did not feel incentivized to go vote. I, I think the problem was the choice. I don't think it was just the tribe, it was the choice. Uh, the two the two candidates that were given were both messy candidates. Uh, one with, with uh, connections to the troubles in Rift Valley in 2007, the other promising to change the constitution. And not only that, this was a man from a family which had been vilified for five, almost five decades by the guy who was now promoting him. I don't know. I think we we don't have uh, we are very unpsychologically aware of how things can be so messed up and confusing. And so when you're presenting these two choices to people and telling them that make this choice right now quickly because the country depends on it, people are going to check out. They are going to say, look, I can't I can't deal with with what you're telling me maybe it's better I just keep off. But I think also there was a disillusionment, which we have all talked about. There was a disillusionment that we have been voting, like me, I've been voting since 1992, the first uh, multi-party election. And 
I can't say apart from the 202 election that I have ever felt that my my voice carried the day. And now imagine if I feel that way, how the younger people feel. So there was also that, and I think um, I think people are, are reading too much into tribe, and that's what I'm saying. We read so much into it more than it is worth giving credit to. And that is because year after year, uh, study after study, that has been the focus. And so I think people are missing tribalism strangely enough they don't know what to do without that explanation and that's it's, it's really very awkward but i think we need to let go of it and become more complex in the way we think this zero-sum game that it must be this or the other does not belong in the 21st century and that unfortunately i have to say this it goes back to education and our experience as a colony that we have been taught to see things in black and white and unfortunately that's not how it is thank you very much dr Njoya. we will direct the next question to our friend dr kaninga since you uh, raised the issue of development issues but this is an extension of what dr Njoya was saying the question is what is in store for the donor community and development partners under the ruto administration do they, meaning donor and uh, development partners, have anything to be concerned about? Uh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, but, but, but before getting to the question of international community and whether they are concerned about anything else, I would like really, like really to emphasize uh, one or two things regarding uh, why people vote on basis of ethnicity or even tribe. Sometimes we tend to look at Kenya's politics as if it's not issue-based. When a particular community mobilizes its support against or for a particular political party, it's itself um, based on certain grievances or past certain policy choices. And since um, uh, this has been a pattern over the years, we have got to dig deep and ask ourselves, why is this particular grouping uh, agonizing over this or that? And this is especially because uh, our development in this country has always been uh, uh, based on political considerations rather than uh, objective reality of saying a government must serve and serve everyone. We have regions in this country uh, where in the last 60 years uh, fall behind everyone else and no one pays particular emphasis to what needs to be done in order for those particular regions to catch up with the rest of the country. That's how the grim the situation is. But going back to the international community and whether uh, what, what, what is it that um, uh, the international community will have uh, to fear or not fear uh, from uh, 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 the government of uh, uh, President, uh, President Ruto. I think we need to call a spend a spend from the very beginning here. In 2013, uh, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto were, uh, inter were inducted by the International Criminal Court for violence and crimes committed in the 2007 general elections. Their relationship with the international community and with the West in the period between 2013 and 2017 is one we can say no love lost. Relations started to improve between them uh, from uh, 2017 onwards up to present day. So one can say that the international community and uh, 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 the government of President um, uh, William Ruto, one can read it from either the past or the present. Reading it from the present, one can say that you can see a lot of animation, especially among the Western international community, animation and a lot of interest in the government of uh, 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 William Ruto. Uh, this is usually appearing in the media circles and in, in social media that um, uh, the Western media seem to be, uh, uh, if I can say, the, the Western international community uh, seems to be uh, happy with uh, William Ruto because of his eloquence, his, um, uh, of what he wants, what he, what he promises to do. But that's a question of wait, uh, wait, wait, wait and see. If you read it from the past, the international criminal case uh, uh, situation, one may want to say that he will begin his administration with, uh, um, with that particular understanding that uh, uh, um, the international community 
sees him from that particular point of view, that he had crimes for which he had never been cleared up to present day. So it's a question of wait and see. But most above everything else, I think the international community will be uh, concerned about reversals in terms of uh, democratic governance, uh, the question of rule of law, um, and the question of corruption more than anything else. Uh, because these are uh, the hallmarks, these are the uh, important bunches of honor uh, uh, among several people uh, within his court. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it, Dr. Kaninga. I'll go back to Dr. Odote. Um, there's a question here that asks, um, how much of the youth disengagement is rooted in apathy related to the political leaders, vice the novelty of the new constitution and rocky elections in 2007, 2008 have worn off? Yes, take that question again. How much of the youth disengagement is rooted in apathy related to the political leaders, vice the, novel, the novelty of the new constitution and rocky elections in 2007, 2008 have worn off? I think uh, the rocky nature of the 2007 and 2008 have worn off the country. Uh, we have moved on as a country but we still remember those 2007, 2008 post-election violence. But I think everybody believes that if you look at the 2010 constitution, it has taken us very far from where we were in 2007. And the chances that we can go back to the situation we were in 2007 is extremely minimal. Moving into this election, and you remember my conversations, I think uh, even here when the Observer Group was here, moving into this election, there were fears that there were possibilities of having some levels of violence out of that election. I think the outcome of this election is a demonstration that the reforms that we've had as a country, the changes through the new constitution, uh, I think both Wandia and Karuti has uh, talked about the money that has gone to the bulk government, and she was that while the presidency continues to be a critical player, people have the, fe the feeling that life, uh, the outcome of an election cannot be uh, a do or die as it was in 2007, that's the one. So I think that the challenges that the young people have is not the challenges of 2007. I think the greatest challenges that young people have is a challenge of apathy, that they had a constitution uh, that promised them uh, a democratic country, a constitution that promised them sustainable development, a constitution that promised them economic uh, development. Uh, I think the young people are now saying, it was good while we waited. If you remember that is a famous statement. Now that it has arrived, we don't seem to have anything to look forward to because they have a leadership that comes into uh, power year in, year out with a robust constitution and with huge promises. And as the years go by after those elections, uh, there are hopes as young people wane. And I think just to chime in on something that Professor Karuti is saying, I think that is the, he, that's the greatest burden that uh, President-elect William Ruto will carry. Uh, a burden where he has come in with very clear thoughts of what to do uh, about the country, a burden where he has made very many commitments. Some of them, uh, people who have been here for longer say, but these ones are just campaign gimmicks. They cannot be met. The burden that he has is that he must deliver on them because you are dealing with a youth population that is very apathetic of leadership. And they are looking, if you don't deliver on any of the things they're saying, same old, same old, we don't have to care about the leadership. And I think that's, the, for me, the greatest challenge that young people have, a challenge of apathy, a challenge of distrust in political leadership. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Odote. We have, we've come to the end of our session. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists that have joined us straight from Kenya. We actually were excited to have an all Kenyan panel to dissect Kenya for us. I would like to thank our audience, wherever they're joining us from. This concludes our session. Thank you very much.